you all, um, mothers and fathers who were mothers. And so it's Mother's Day, and it's a happy Mother's Day, or is it? I have to confess, I'm truly not a fan of Mother's Day. Now don't get me wrong, I love when my kids call me and I love when they wish me a happy Mother's Day. But honestly, I see another, mother's, another side of Mother's Day and it distresses me a little bit. In Romans 14, 13 to 19, it says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another. But decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing in, is unclean in itself. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, don't destroy the one whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves the Lord is acceptable to God and approved by man. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. So in this passage, the scripture, Paul, in this scripture, sorry, in this passage of scripture, Paul's basically talking about um, <clears throat> we need to decide not to put anything in the way of other Christians, basically causing them to trip spiritually. And the above scriptures is talking about clean and unclean foods. Those who are stronger in their faith are older Christians, more mature Christians. They knew that the scriptures were there that said that you could eat anything, that it was free, that you could eat meat, you didn't have to observe special days, you didn't have to do sacrifices like they used to. But the new Christians, they were taught that they couldn't eat certain foods. And so when the stronger Christians were eating those foods, the younger Christians, or the new believers, if you will, were struggling with that. And Paul's basically saying, you don't need to abstain, but if it's causing your brother or sister to fall, then you need to respect them and you need to love them. We shouldn't think, and it's not sinful, the actions weren't sinful, but that they should think of others first so as not to let them trip up spiritually. So all that to say, when it comes to Mother's Day, I don't particularly like the warm, fuzzy Mother's Day messages. Primarily because I never want to intentionally hurt somebody. I don't want to cause them to spiritually trip, if you will. So some people have absolutely amazing mothers. Stellar superheroes um, they, that we rely on. <coughs> others don't. Some are themselves amazing mothers, and others are not. Some have terrible mom experiences, and some couldn't live without their moms. Some don't have mothers anymore, like myself, and like Pastor Ted. Some never knew their mothers. And some could never be mothers. And so I want to be sensitive to the fact that each mother-child relationship here in this room, as well as those watching on the internet, is completely different. Today as I share my story, I just want you to know that um, this is uh, it's a little bit difficult for me to share. I know now as an adult, that my mother loved me. But growing up, I didn't feel loved. I didn't feel accepted. I wasn't the oldest favorite child that my brother was. I wasn't the youngest precious child that my sister was. 
I grew up from the age of nine with the knowledge of something I was never supposed to know. Words from my mother's lips that said she didn't want me. Now let me explain. My parents were in separation. The adults had a meeting, and the meeting was to discuss the arrangements of who the children would live with. I was supposed to stay in the bedroom with my siblings while the adults had their conversation. But I left to go to the bathroom because basically I was nosy. I wanted to hear what was being said. <laughs> um, one should never overhear some conversations. But I did. In fact, it was a conversation I wish I had never heard. I remember clearly hearing my mom say she was taking my brother and my sister, but that my father could have me. My father said that he didn't want me. And she said, stated, I don't want her either. They actually argued for a time over who didn't want to keep me. And so these statements stuck with me through, my, through to my adult ears. I never told anyone what I heard, but it was always there. So even when my mom would say to us as we were getting onto the school bus, every day my mom would wave from the window or and as, she, as we were leaving the door she would say, I love you. But I knew in my heart, because of what I'd heard, that those words, I love you, were for my siblings, and they weren't for me. Mm -hmm. Everything she said, I weighed against what I'd heard her say when I was nine. One statement said to a group of adults, that I overheard. One statement. I grew up always believing I was unloved, unlovable, unwanted, and a burden. And I did my best to stay out of the way. I got lost into, I actually had a closet where I would go to read and I got lost in books. I tried to be invisible. I remember going on family drives. And remember that I love for books. It was the way that I could escape. So when we'd go on family drives, I knew the family drive was for my siblings in my head, because remember, I'm a kid. And I would try to bring my books, and my parents wouldn't let me bring my books. And sometimes they would frisk me and like, do you have any books on you I want to see so that we could, I could bring the books with me? And I always thought it was to punish me. I thought it was because they didn't like me. Or when I was told to do something, I wasn't, or when I was told I wasn't allowed to do something, again, it was always because they didn't like me. Those words of rejection at a young age shaped who I was in ways that I can't describe. And it followed me in everything I did. As I got older, and certain groups of students at school made fun of me, made fun of my clothing, or something I did, a particular body part of that I feature that I didn't like, that I was self-conscious about, it made me draw further into myself and cemented my belief that I was unwanted. I wasn't a happy person, and I didn't have joy inside. And I certainly had no confidence. I knew instinctively that I had to find something, anything. I was determined to prove that I had value. I got a job at the age of 14, and I quickly realized that if I worked hard, the boss liked me, or rather liked my work. The boss liking my work was pretty important because if they liked my work, I got more hours. More hours meant more money. 
more money meant that I didn't need to rely on anybody or anyone. Anybody could say what they wanted, and if I didn't react, then they couldn't hurt me. But it did. I didn't have many friends, but I had a ton of acquaintances. I pretty much knew the whole school. And instinctively, I seemed to know that um, <laughs> if I was friendly, I could make someone smile, and somehow it made their day better because they didn't have to be unhappy because somebody was nice to them. And again, I was friendly. I didn't let too many people get close to me or to actually know me. I quickly learned that if I was responsible and didn't cause problems for anybody at the school, the teachers appreciated me. And I learned to use the responsibility to my benefit. I became, sorry, I began to go um, to the teacher's houses as their babysitter. Again, remember, babysitting meant more money, more money meant being self-sufficient not needing to rely on anyone else. I was in control. It wasn't about the money, it was about my control, being able to control my environment. In our failures, our Heavenly Father loves us. He loved me even when I didn't realize it. He loved me when I overheard a conversation at nine years old and he loved me growing up as I consistently isolated myself as much as I could from my mom. Seeing God as a loving father was a concept that was extremely, extremely difficult for me. When I came to know him at the age of 30, my belief that my own mother, the woman who carried me, who birthed me, who raised me, who didn't particularly like me, who didn't understand me, and to my thinking, didn't love me. How then could a God, a God I didn't see, hadn't met or talked to, how could he love me? Because if my earthly parent couldn't love me, how could a Heavenly Father love me? And it took me a really long time to even believe that my husband loved me. <laughs> Truly loved me. <clears throat> so now I had to believe that God, my Father, loved me. And, and just supposing God did love me. How could he forgive me? How could he forgive me for holding on to this underlying anger and disrespect that I had, I knew I had, toward my mother? Every conversation, every gesture, every day I weighed what my mother said against what I'd overheard as a nine-year-old. And that anger carried over into areas of my life I judge the words, I love you, based on the knowledge and the belief that I truly wasn't loved. So every time my husband would say, I love you, I still catch myself doing it saying, okay, yeah, right, whatever. <laughs> Not as many times anymore, but, but you know, um, it, it, it was something that was born deep, and it's, it was hard to believe that he loved me. I needed to be free, and to be free, I needed to forgive. I needed to honor the Father by letting go of the very thing that kept me safe in my mind. Letting go of my control of things. And once you're in control and you think you're not, because we're not, but once you think that you're in control, 
it's really tough to give that control over to somebody else. To let go of the anger I carried like a blanket around me. Let go of the belief that nobody really and truly loved me or wanted me around. Unconditional trust and belief that he is who he says he is. And he does what he says he does. He said he loves us. He died on the cross because he loves us. It wasn't easy for me to do it. I can't tell you the times I struggled to believe that the Father loved me. It was eternal battle for years. I fought it. He sees our struggles. He sees our tears. He sees when we mess up, when we miss the mark, when we just blow it. He sees it. And, and he still loves us. But we have to come to the place of admitting what we've done wrong. We have to be willing to say, God, I blew it. God, I blew it. I'm not walking right. My thoughts are dark, and I don't see the light. In 1 John 1, 1 to 9, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. And in him there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So I had to get to a place to leave the darkness, to see the light, to trust that light. I confess my sins and he forgave me. He cleansed me, and he healed me. When I came to the knowledge that this anger that I had toward my mom and the relationship I had with her was a result of so much of that anger, I had to do something else. I had to forgive myself. See, it's easy to ask God to forgive us. And there's something else that's an entirely different kettle of fish trying to forgive yourself. See, I had to forgive her for the words she spoke. And when I believe was her distress, but I had to forgive myself for holding that against her. Because maybe, maybe if I wasn't so angry out of all those years for not wanting me, maybe we could have had a better relationship. Then, then I had to carry over that forgiveness of myself for the anger that I brought into the other relationships that I had with my family. And then I had to begin mending, mending some fences. Going forward, our mother-daughter relationship, while it wasn't perfect, was a lot better than it was, and we actually had one. I learned to respect her. She was my mom. 
But once I let go of my anger, things were better. And they were better because primarily I stopped judging everything that she said based on something I'd heard. I stopped looking for the hidden meaning of things and questioning everything that she said to me. Years later, a few months before my mom passed away, I had the privilege of leading her to Christ. We didn't have very much time from the time she accepted the Lord to the time that she went to be with him. But the time that we did have was amazing. Our conversations were different. The first time I saw and witnessed a relationship with my mom, and I was so thankful that it had changed so drastically. But it wasn't for very long. I'll never forget the last conversation that I had with her. She had come to our house for the first time in years. And uh, she asked if she could go to church with us. And she was still quite weak from being in hospital for a few months. And I said, sure. So we took two vehicles. My mom came with me. On the way home, we were driving in the car. And we had a really good conversation. Now, it was only a few minutes out of town, but for some reason it seemed to take a long time to get home. In one part of the conversation, she said to me, you're always so logical. I never understood that. I can count on you to always think things through, to get things done. You're fair. You never want to hurt others. I really admire that. You have no idea what those words did to me. God gave me a gift. Those words from my mom, they were a gift that I will always cherish. In that last conversation that I had with her, she said several things, and I won't go into all of the things of the conversations. I said it seemed like it took forever. It's like God made time stand still in that car. She said several things that reached to him and pulled out those places that were here that were broken. Pieces in me that God knew I needed healing still. And it was like he was speaking through her to all those broken pieces. Things that he knew still hurt me. Things that he knew I still held on to. That I'd stuffed down. That day brought so much healing to my life. When my mom passed, it was tough because I was so looking forward to a longer, more fulfilling relationship and trying to rebuild what we didn't have. But it wasn't to be, at least not here on earth. But he is so faithful. He sees our struggles and our tears, the very things that we keep head hidden. He sees our regrets, our <clears throat> shame. He sees the weaknesses, the mess-ups, and he still loves us. We cannot force one person on earth to love us. But God, God does. He doesn't need force. He doesn't need force to love us. He just does. I shared my story with you guys this morning because our, my relationship with my mom is an example of our relationship with Christ, is not? For 23 years, I held on to anger. Some of those years, I was too young to have named what it was. 23 years when I could have potentially had a different relationship with my mom. One where it wasn't all about me. 
all about my hurt. One where maybe, maybe I could have understood her pain and her hurt. See, God is asking us for a different relationship. He wants us to see him in a different light. It isn't about me. It isn't about us. But it's of him. It's about him. See, it isn't about you be a good girl, you be a good boy, and he'll love you. No, he just does. He just does. He wants to spend time with us. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to show you guys. He wants to whisper to you how important you are. How important and valuable you are to him. He wants us to know how much that he loves us. We don't have to do anything to earn it. Nothing. He loves us. He wants us to spend time with him so we can know him deeper. That he can bless us more. How can we know this? It's a fundamental truth of this word, but how can we know it if we don't spend time with him? If we don't know him. He desires to spend time with us and he wants us to seek him. The word seek, it means to intentionally search for, to want to find, initiate, and to look for. I decided very young that when and if I had children, that they would always know that they were loved. There were no conditions on how much I loved them. They, when they placed the, those babies in my arms, I loved them. They couldn't do anything that would stop me from loving them, although they did try. They do and could and still do things that I don't particularly like. I didn't raise angels. But I always love them. And I'm pretty positive that I do things that they don't particularly like. But I know that they love me. As a mom, I want my children and grandchildren to look to me to spend time with me, to know me. More importantly, I want them to know that I love them unconditionally. That there's always an open door for them to come to and to be available to them. And isn't that what our Father wants from us? We can no longer come to him with a me-first attitude. We need to know that he wants us to know him. He wants to give us gifts that he has for us. I'm a gift giver. I love giving gifts to people. I love giving gifts to my kids and going out to a, a place and seeing something going, oh, Ted would like that, or the kids would like this. Or, like, I always have little things for the kids. It probably drives them crazy because I always come with bags of stuff. It's not to buy their love. It's just a free gift. But we need to know what he wants for us as well. We have to be intentional and committed to getting to know who he is. If we don't truly know him, how can we tell anybody about him? You can't talk about someone you don't yeah. know. If somebody asks you unexpectedly, who is Christ? You gotta know. You gotta know who he is. Unforgiveness and anger stole years of my life. Unforgiveness and anger are a thief. And the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Christ, Christ healed. But if I had never learned about who he was, I can't even imagine what my life would be. I can't imagine the bitterness 
I would have held on to. So yes, today is Mother's Day. And if you have an amazing mom, I'm so happy for you. Let her know how precious she is. We don't have them for very long. If you're an amazing mom, kudos to you. It's hard work. I pray that your kids let you know how precious you are. If you find yourself with regret for how you parented your child, forgive yourself. Don't hold on to the shame and the guilt. If you don't like the way you're parenting, change it. If you need help, get it. Life is too precious. If you're able to reach out to let them know that you love them, please do. But don't keep beating yourself up. Get rid of the thief in your life. He has no business there. Jesus took that away from us. We don't have to give license to the enemy to continually keep us in shame, guilt, and fear, and anger. There's no condemnation in Christ. God is a God of second chances. And he turns mourning into dancing. He removes the sackcloth. He clothes us with joy. He gives us beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning. He gives us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And he loves us. In 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. You hear that? Love covers a multitude of sins. His word says it. So today, Mother's Day, can we rebuke the thief and put God first? <clears throat> can we wake up every morning and say, God, what do you want me to know about you today? Because knowing him means we can serve others, love one another earnestly, and make it less about us and more about him. Can we be intentional today? Starting today, can we seek after Christ? 